Oh. be getting started in about 60 seconds, everybody.
Okay, everybody, why don't we get started? Take your seats, get some food at the last minute. The food will be there. There's plenty, plenty of food available. Well, good morning, and welcome to our summit on single-payer health care in New York State. I'm Chris Palmetto. I'm a faculty member here uh, in the Department of Community Health and Social Sciences here at the CUNY Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy. And um, it's exciting to see everyone here for this wonderful event. You know, New York City and New York State uh, have played important roles in the history of healthcare advocacy in the United States, probably the most important roles of any city in any state. Um, the American Association of Labor Legislation was the first organization to put forward universal health care bills in this country. Um, they had their first meeting here in New York City in April of 1905. The AAAL made several attempts to introduce universal health care in different states during the progressive era, and the universal health care proposal was even carried forward by Teddy Roosevelt, um, a progressive candidate and a New Yorker, of course, uh, in his presidential campaign of 1912. Roosevelt lost that campaign. And more efforts were to come, uh, including a very close, but again, unfortunately, unsuccessful campaign in New York State in 1919, so 100 years ago. Uh, unfortunately, none of those movements could overcome the opposition of business, fraternal organizations, um, and even medical associations who were opposed to universal care. Uh, these organizations created extensive lobbying campaigns, communication strategies, included printed pamphlets, carefully crafted messages appealing to American values of liberty and free enterprise, uh, calling universal health care un-American and socialist, sort of unfortunately sounds familiar. They would have used Cambridge Analytica if, if they had that opportunity as well. Uh, so here we are today, 100 years later, right here in New York and Harlem, exploring these very same issues. And a lot of dynamics, again, are the same. Um, but we do have some opportunities that we didn't have. And one is networking. So what brings us here today. Today we're here to talk, we're here to listen, uh, to reflect, and to follow up. We'll do this in person, but we'll also do it through social media. So please um, tag us, chat with us. We're, being, we're live streaming this right now on Facebook Live. So this is our opportunity to stay in touch today, right now, and then in the future going forward. Uh, when our program is finished today, Professor Nick Freudenberg, who's here, will share some thoughts on how to keep the momentum of today going forward. And before we get started, which we will in just a second, I want to also acknowledge our, our co-presenter, the Scholars Strategy Network. Uh, Scholars Strategy Network connects researchers with journalists, civic leaders, and policymakers to improve policy and strengthen democracy. If you're a faculty member or a PhD student, you can join the network uh, to support your public engagement. So, um, if you're, uh, so Isaac Jabola coordinates the New York City chapter of the Scholar Strategy Network, and please say hi to Isaac, and he's over there. Uh, and now, our program and our moderator, Adashima Oyo. Adashima Oyo is a second year PhD student at the CUNY Graduate Center, following her MPH degree from Brooklyn College and the CUNY School of Public Health, where, um, uh, she's an adjunct faculty at NYU and Brooklyn College, where she teaches courses on health sciences and research methods, and her research interests focus on the minority-majority demographic shift occurring in America. So, please give a warm welcome to Adashima, who will be introducing our panelists.
Thank you for that introduction, Chris. So I'm very happy to be here on behalf of the CUNY Graduate Center. And I'm even more excited to be talking about this topic today because it's something that I'm very closely passionate about. So my research interest is in um, healthcare disparities. So with that said, let's take a quick moment to learn a little bit more about our panelists and then we're gonna jump right into the discussion. So first we have um, Gerald Friedman. Gerald Friedman is a professor of economics at the University of Massachusetts. He earned his PhD in economics from Harvard University and joined the faculty at the University of Massachusetts in 1984. In addition to his 1998 book, State Making and Labor Movements in the United States and France, 1876 to 1914, he has written Reigniting the Labor Movement, published in 2008, and numerous articles on topics in labor history the evolution of economic thought, and he has also written extensively on current economic issues. He has consulted with various labor unions and has drafted funding plans for campaigns for single period health insurance in eight states and inside of the United States. Please give a warm welcome for Gerald Friedman. <laughs> Next we have Marissa Martin. Marissa Martin is the Northeast Director of the Young Invincibles a nonprofit with the mission of amplifying the voices of young adults in the political processes around issues that matter to them. The Young Invincible's core issues include healthcare access, workforce development, and higher education. Prior to joining the Young Invincibles, Marissa held leadership roles at the New York City Public Engagement Unit, Expand Ed Schools, formerly TASC, and the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families. Marissa is a proud social worker and serves as the board chair of the Advocacy Institute. And Marissa also earned her MSW from CUNY's Hunter College. Please give a warm welcome for Marissa. <laughs> Next we have Kim Barron. Um, Kim is an ER nurse at a public hospital in New York City, where she witnesses devastating inequalities of our healthcare insurance-based uh, healthcare system. Kim believes the public hospital is often the last option for many people who are underinsured or have no insurance. Uh, Kim is an active member of the New York State Nurses Association and an RN board member of Physicians for National Health Program, an organization that advocates for single payer healthcare systems. Please give a warm welcome. We also have uh, Marva Wade. Marva retired from Mount Sinai Medical Center after 45 years of nursing. Uh, she distinguished herself during this time in numerous roles, including president of the local bargaining union, a position she held for more than 20 years. Under Marva's leadership, the negotiating committee was first among the New York State Association facilities to achieve an experience differential in, ho in a hospital contract. Marwa was again a first as an RN drawn from a collective bargaining unit to be elected president of the New York State Nurses Association. Um, she has doggedly pursued the advancement of single payer legislation, appearing countless times across the state to promote guaranteed health care for all. Please welcome Marwa. And last but not least, we have Mark Levine. Mark is a New York City council member who represents the 7th District of Northern Manhattan. Serving as the chair of Council Committee on Health and as a member of the Progressive Caucus, he is a leader on many issues including public health, education, economic justice, transportation, environmentalism, and more. Uh, Councilmember Levine has been a strong advocate for addressing inequality in New York City. He is also a leading voice on housing issues as he has, as he has successfully fought to make New York the first place in America to guarantee free legal representation for low-income tenants in New York City housing courts. Yes, wow. <laughs> we hope it's true. <laughs> so now that we've uh, taken a moment to learn a little bit about our panelists in three to five sentences as much as we can possibly learn, I think we should dive right into the questions and I think we should get started because we are here to talk about the politics, the economics, and the prospects of single-payer health care in New York State. So my first question is for Gerald. And Gerald, if you could just walk us through, what does a single payer healthcare bill look like in New York State? And more importantly, can New York State afford single payer healthcare? I understand you have some slides, so I'm gonna let Jerry take over. Yeah. 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 Excellent. And I'm gonna also ask all the speakers to try to keep your responses to five minutes for this first round. And if you don't, I'll just politely but forcefully move you along. Thank you. Hello, we lost the connection. Ah. Oh. Now it's Ivy. Okay, let's see. 
Here we go. Ah, there we go. Okay. Up. Oh, oh, there it goes again. Okay. Oh, well, we may just have to do it like this. Yeah. Okay. Maybe. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. This this is the wrong. Can we afford it? Is the wrong question. The real question is, can we afford the current system? And the answer is no, because the current system is so wasteful. What? Okay, so that's. Ah, wait. You do it. <laughs> oh, there we go. Now we're moving. Okay, there we go. Um, okay, here's the problem in New York. Uh, the blue line here represents health spending, and the red line represents income. And this is all indexed to 2000, actually 1991. Um, since then, you can see health spending is increasing faster and faster than income. It's projected to grow even faster, which means, every, and, you know, we all experience this. And, you know, Mark has in this legend in the uh, city assembly, uh, you know about this every year. You have to take money from education, from roads, from vacations, from people's paychecks to put them in, put that money into paying for more expensive health care. Now, um, it might not be so bad. Uh, well, there's the lost income because of wages. It might not be so bad if we were getting good health care. I would not complain if we're spending a lot of money and we're living a long, to long time, being really healthy and happy and all that. But no, we get really mediocre health care in this country. Um, uh, on average, <laughs> now, last month I was down in Florida and I was debating a Zeke Emanuel, of all people, in front of an audience of hospital CEOs, minimum income, $1 million. Um, and I brought up this slide and Zeke said, ah, life expectancy is a bad measure. Like, what's a good measure? But whatever measure you take, actually, oh no, we lost it again. Um, well, whatever measure you take, oh, now we're back, sort of. I'll let you figure it out. <laughs> okay. Uh, whatever measure you take, the United States does badly. Maternal mortality, infant mortality, morbidity, lost sick days, whatever you look at, we do badly compared to the rest of the world. Now, there are two ways you can look at how badly we're doing. One is you could say we're spending all this money. We should have, given all the money we're spending, if we were like other countries, we would have life expectancy of about six years more than we have. Or you could say we're spending all this money and we're only getting life expectancy comparable to Chile, a nice country, but relatively poor. Then we should be able to get that life expectancy while spending $7,000 less. At this point, I ask people, which would you rather have, six years or the $7,000? In an audience of young invincibles, oh, where's Marissa? Uh, there you are. Uh, they would say, oh, God, I could pay off my college loans with the $7,000. You know, in an audience of gray hairs, we're like, give me the, give me the life expectancy. Okay, now, why, is life, why are we doing so badly? Um, the reason has nothing to do with the nurses. They're not overpaid. It doesn't have much to do with the doctors. They're paid more than in other countries, but not all that much. And, and their incomes are not rising very quickly. The reason has to do with we waste so much money on administrative bloat, what Republicans would call waste and abuse, while we allow hospitals and drug companies to basically set their own prices. And that problem of monopoly pricing by hospitals and drugs is getting worse all the time. So waste, abuse, and fraud. You know, everything that Ronald Reagan condemned in the U.S. government, it's not there. It's certainly not in New York City. No, no. It's in the health care sector. Okay, that's why we can save so much money with the New York health plan. Um, over there, I give my estimates, and you know, we could talk about the estimates. You know, you could read my paper, you could read modifications of it, we could get going on that. But what it comes down to is savings on administration um, uh, of health insurance sector would save about $26 billion if the 
health insurance companies were as efficient as Medicare, we'd save $26 billion. We could also save another $21 billion in hospitals and provider offices. Um, if you go into your doctor's office and go around the back, you'll see people, often trained nurses, wasting their days calling the insurance companies and asking for permission to do things. You add to this, we could save some money from drug if we paid only what the rest of the world pays on drugs, and overall you'd save $21 billion. Now, some of that money would go right back into the healthcare system, re-employing many of the people who are going to lose their jobs. Um, if we provide, uh, if we treat Medicaid the way we treat med the rest of the system, we're going to be putting more money into doctors' pockets, the providers, doctors and nurses and hospitals who provide for Medicaid people. Um, people would start using health care more without co-pays and deductibles. That would save lives, but it will also cost $11 billion. And then we'd be covering everybody. That's going to cost another $5 billion. Here are the numbers. And then note, we'll be spending less overall, but we'll be spending more on health care. We'll actually be spending more money on health care, even while we're saving money overall by getting rid of waste, fraud, and abuse. Thank you. Thank you. Let's welcome Marissa back to the stage. <laughs> So my next question is for Marva, and Kim, you can chime in if you like, but the question is, uh, state nursing associations have had a really long history of supporting universal health care, even though physician support hasn't been as, uh, as strong. Why does New York State Nurses Association support single pay health care in New York? And also, please share with us some of the actual things that you know nurses have been doing around this movement. Thank you so much for the question. Um, that was a really nice introduction that I got, but the other thing that I am in my association of uh, 43,000 members right now, we just organized a unit up in uh, Albany, is the fact that I am the first vice president of New York State Nurse Association and chair of our political action committee. So I get to do a lot of work up in Albany as far as getting work done with the legislators. One of our longtime uh, sponsors for New York Health was uh, Senator Bill Perkins. And Senator Perkins always opened with one thing, and he would say, your health is your wealth. So I say to all of you potential patients that I'm looking at right now, because all of you are potential patients, what nurses have been saying for decades, our health is not for sale. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that's the problem with US healthcare, as we've already heard. Too many medical decisions are determined by how much money is in your bank account. When I was working, I was an operating room nurse. I got to see you on the worst day of your life, pretty much. So the last thing that either one of us were thinking about or talking about, this is not one of my favorite things, but I'll use it because he's making me. Uh, one of the last things I never talked about with the patient was who's going to pay for this. How much is this going to cost? Nobody ever asked me that, and I never asked the patient that. So no one sees more acutely than nurses on the front line, and that is why the New York State Nurses Association is at the forefront for calling for single-payer universal health care in New York, but not just in New York, across this country, as you've already heard. As people may know, we have passed the New York Health Act in the Assembly three times and we plan on doing it again in May. The assembly is pretty much democratic dominated. Our co-sponsor there is uh, Richard Godfrey, and he works tirelessly on getting this work done. So what are we gonna do about the Senate? Our fight for New York health is in the state Senate in response to Trump. The New York State Democratic Party has lined up behind the New York Health Act in a way that shows the difference between the New York Dems and the Republicans. We have 29 co-sponsors, senators, in for the New York Health Act. 32 votes are needed to pass, so we're coming up a little short. 
as Dems win the two open Senate seats in the special election on April 24th, then we will have 31 sponsors in the Senate, just one away from a majority. There's only one problem with that, politics and elections. One never knows how that's gonna work out. So the Democrats are not in charge of the New York State Senate and we don't have a single Republican co-sponsor. So as the chair of our PAC, I spend a lot of time, as does other members of the PAC and members, going out speaking to legislators about the importance of taking care of New Yorkers. So it's very clear that we have our work cut out for us. Every day, we're out there asking, begging, telling people, giving information. So we work with many coalitions and other groups across the state to leverage political energy and activism on the issue of single payer health care, including groups like the Poor People's Campaign, Commission on the Public Health System. NISNA members have opportunities to learn about single payer in all our publications, conferences, lobby days. We offer lunch and learns in our 149 facilities where the members come for lunchtime and the topic is single payer health care. So we are getting the word out there, not just for the public, but for our own members. So New York State members have an opportunity to lobby their elected officials on this issue. NISNA members speak out in their communities and hearings, letters to the editor, <laughs> community groups advocating for New York Health. If every union engaged in single pair the way the nurses do, we would be winning on this issue. Thank you. It sounds like NICE is doing a lot for community mobilization. Kim, do you want to add anything to what uh, Marva said? Absolutely. We um, are looking at the current social movement that can have a powerful impact on what is politically possible. And this must be a social movement to win the right to health care because we know that health care is not a privilege, but it's a human right for everyone. We know from polling that a majority of the Americans support this issue, both Republicans and Democrats. And when looking at political party, Democrats and independents overwhelmingly support this concept. It's ultimately a legislative fight, but we need to change what is poss politically possible in the New York State Senator Legislature and ultimately Congress to win. We know our history. We've known from many social movements in the past where issues such as uh, women's suffrage, civil rights, workers' rights, and now it's really health care rights. We have to take what we know as good policy and make it good politics. We do this by finding ways to show the tremendous public support there is for the issue. Even though we aren't getting a lot of media attention, there are um, other outlets that allow um, this to occur. We had a recent meeting in Washington, D.C. with uh, Senator Bernie Sanders where he had a town hall meeting on the first national uh, front with um, uh, out, uh, online media called Young Turks where they televised the first hearing of public on a broad scale. Um, both Katie Robbins and I were there to attend. Um, <clears throat> So there are a lot of uh, tactics that we're employing. One of them is just simply speaking out to support the bill. It's something that I do every day when I work, whether I wear this t-shirt, where I meet someone here um, in these uh, settings, or just to the general public. It's something that we always are having a dialogue with and to support the New York Health Act that we have in the uh, assembly now. Joining with local uh, committees, working on the issues that are organizing public events, canvassing, talking to our neighbors and our businesses. Um, in District 7, uh, in next month, uh, Brian Kavanaugh will be having a town hall meeting. It's something that I attended last year with um, uh, Dan Daniel Squadron. And when I just went to the little uh, kind of uh, breakout groups, one of them was concerning health care. It was amazing how many people showed up in this breakout group and every single person from young college students, high school students, and their parents were there concerned about health care. So it's a really an issue on everyone's mind right now. And Katie has over there uh, for uh, support and signing the card, 
getting additional information in the New York uh, New York State Health dot org. I'm oh, sorry, let me correct that. It's New York Campaign dot org. Thank and you, Kim. Complete those forms and turn it in. We're going to collect it so you can get connected. Check out your local district, see if there are any other town hall meetings. Get involved. You would be so surprised how many people just like you have the same concerns about health care. Okay, thank you, Kim, for that response. So it sounds like NYSNA is doing a lot of work around community mobilization and single payer health care. So that's really awesome. So you actually segued us into the next question for Marissa. So Marissa, our understanding is that um, you know, healthcare access is such an, is an important topic for, for youth in the, in the communities that you work with. Could you tell us a little bit more about why this is such an important topic for recent immigrants and youth? And could you also, you know, tell us about how do you go about um, incorporating single-payer healthcare systems into the advocacy work of the Young Invincibles? Absolutely. So, <clears throat> uh, can everyone hear me? Um, yes, we can hear you. So, Young Invincibles was uh, started actually in 2009 around healthcare access in DC around the Affordable Care Act. Because there were a lot of conversations happening, um, and there were a lot of assumptions that young adults didn't care about healthcare, so they just weren't really reaching out to young adults. They were saying, you know, the policy will just uh, come to fruition, and, and young adults, you know, will participate, and they weren't really. Um, looking at specific issues that impact that or um, that impact young adults. And so Young Invincibles um, went out and they started talking to young adults at college campuses and they started doing surveys and holding focus groups and really hearing that, um, as everyone on this stage knows, healthcare impacts everyone. And there were major concerns amongst young adults around healthcare and around, you know, um, what would happen if they got hurt suddenly? Yes, they're young and healthy, but what would happen if they got into an accident? We were just talking about New York City is a very unsafe place. If you're riding your bike, you could be hit at any moment. So, um, you know, when these things happen while, um, you know, you're negotiating these policies, they do really impact people. And I think for the immigrant communities especially, um, it really impacts not only how they access health care, but digging deeper into the outreach around how you're educating immigrant communities um, what you, what lengths you have to take to really make sure that you're explaining um, this, you know, any any new sort of healthcare policy and how it's going to impact the immigrant community. Uh, the New York um, the New York Health Act I think is great because it doesn't specify and it is inclusive to all immigrants regardless of immigration status. I think that's a huge huge issue. I think that it's a population that very often in the conversations are left out. Um, and so same thing with. I, I would say as we move forward and uh, for Young Invincibles for our advocacy is really trying to play a part in making sure that we are collecting those stories, we are collecting those voices. So then as we try to put the pressure on the state senate or on um, you know whatever decision makers we need to is that they're not only hearing that this is important to immigrants and young adults, um, up, I mean upstate healthcare is still important to young adults upstate, right? It's not just a downstate issue, um, so you can put pressure. But then also in those conversations, you're talking about the unique needs of some of these communities. Um, for the Affordable Care Act, uh, you know, there, there was a huge investment on outreach, right? It's really important to think about language accessibility, culturally, uh, cultural competency in uh, doing the outreach and also enrolling folks and making sure that they really understand what this means. Um, you know, when Trump was elected, that means a really, it means very different things for immigrant communities and populations. So when you're rolling out huge statewide plans like this, um, and hopefully, you know, this will pass and we can roll it out, it's really important to be able to include the entire state and include all of the folks that are going to be impacted by this. Um, I know I, I've worked in a lot of different advocacy campaigns on a lot of different spaces and we, you know, you focus on pushing it through like who are our targets, who do we need to get people to call and write letters to and meet with, um, but I think it's also really making sure that along these negotiations that some of this core language that is inclusive um, and does make sure that all New Yorkers are getting health care stays in there and it doesn't just sort of slide, <laughs> slide away during those times. Um, and also that we are, you know, making sure that all of us understand, um, you know, how all of all of the all of the things around it in a culturally competent, language accessible manner. Um, for Young Invincibles in our healthcare advocacy, uh, we're on the steering committee for Healthcare for All New York, as well as Coverage for All. Um, and, and so, you know, as we partner with uh, many health providers. Um, 
who are leading that campaign, Community Service Society leading, <laughs> leading the charge. We want to make sure that um, we are continuously bringing up young adult voice and continuously making sure that we're all thinking about um, immigrant communities and other communities that are not at the table and that we are actively bringing them to the table as we're having these conversations. Thank you. Thank you. So the next question is for Mark. Um, by many estimates, people consider New York City to be one of the greatest cities in the world. But despite that, we have several issues with our health care um, insurance. Could you speak a little bit about why single payer health care is especially important for New York City residents and some of the work that is being done around it? We're only the greatest by many estimates. <laughs> no. We are the greatest city in the world. Uh, I'm standing by that. I would agree. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I do just first want to open by congratulating the people in this room for what you have done to bring single payer out from the fringes of politics to the beating heart, certainly of democratic politics in the city and country when um, Dick Gottfried introduced uh, his bill uh, about 30 years ago. It was considered to be way out there. And uh, now it's passed the assembly three times and there's 31 co-sponsors soon to be in the state Senate. And uh, just about every prominent Democrat running for president in 2020 has already come in out in favor of a national single payer along the lines of what Bernie Sanders uh, has proposed. So that's just a huge accomplishment and one that shouldn't be taken lightly. And it's thanks to the years of work of, of the nurses and labor allies and other progressive activists. This, is, this issue is so important for New York City. Even with all the gains we've made under the Affordable Care Act and reducing the number of uninsured, um, and gains we're still making, by the way, even with the relentless assault from Republicans, um, who, who uh, might make no one want to sign up uh, for the Affordable, Care Act, Air, the Affordable Care Act. We actually netted 80,000 more signups in this enrollment period in New York City, which just tells you the incredible hunger mm -hmm. for health insurance that's out there. Um, imagine if it was actually being promoted by our, our, our national leaders. Um, despite that, there are still an estimated 950,000 uninsured adults in New York City. Uh, thankfully, we have Child, Care, Child Health Plus, which ensures young people, uh, regardless of immigration status. But we have close to a million adults in the five boroughs who aren't insured. And all of you know that if you don't have health insurance, it has very real implications for your health. You are much less likely to get primary care and preventative care and to er early intervention um, and generally don't get treatment until you land in an emergency room. And thank goodness uh, we do treat people uh, with or without insurance in emergency rooms, but it is just not the way, not the best way to provide health care for the patients, for sure. Um, and if you don't have insurance, it's much more difficult to get more sophisticated specialty care. Um, this is a major problem for the health of New Yorkers. And even if you have insurance, um, if close to a million people are not getting vaccinated for contagious diseases and other things, it has implications for all of us. Um, but I do want to talk about why this matters um, for our public health system and our public hospital system, uh, even beyond, beyond the health of those individual patients, because health and hospitals um, is currently suffering with a $1.6 billion deficit projected to grow to $2.1 billion next fiscal year. And if you take a trip to the public hospitals, you will see uh, elevators which don't work and electrical systems which are way out of date and pipes which are bursting and you'll encounter waits to get an appointment that can stretch into the months. And um, that is because of the budgetary problems in health and hospitals. And it's not sustainable. And it is and largely because they are serving uh, over 400,000 uninsured patients a year that they're not able to bill for. And um, so single payer, by solving that problem, is not only going to help the health of, of many New Yorkers, but it's going to save our public hospital system, um, which is essential to health care beyond the public hospitals. I have met with a few um, CEOs of private hospitals and I said, what's the most important thing I can do to help you? And they say, save the public hospitals, because if they stop serving the uninsured 
and those uh, patients show up at the private hospitals, they're then going to bear the financial burden that they're avoiding right now. So this is so critical to the future of healthcare in New York City. Um, I will say that while we were fi while we're fighting um, this battle for single payer at the state level, um, there's a lot we can do to get more people insured here. Um, most of the people who are uninsured in New York City are eligible for insurance. Um, in some cases, through Medicaid, and most through the, one of the uh, subsidized plans on the exchange. So we've got to do more to reach them, to enroll them, to educate them, to get them insured for their benefit and for our benefit. And we need to do more for the undocumented, who are not eligible for any of the um, uh, plans on the exchange or Medicaid. And uh, we can follow the lead of places like San Francisco and Los Angeles, which have created a primary care option for undocumented residents, which gets them the kind of preventative care that is so important for their health and prevents them, again, landing in emergency rooms when things get really bad. So I'm working in the council very, very hard. This is one of my top priorities as health, as health chair to create a program for undocumented immigrants to get them the primary care that they so need while we're fighting this battle for single payer at the state level. Thank you. So now that we've spent our first part learning a little bit more about why this issue is so important, I think that for part two, we really want to talk about what actions can we take to move this forward. We've been talking about single payer health care for many years now, and I want to really um, get some feedback from our expert panels about how we can move this forward. So I want to first start with uh, Gerald again. And uh, you've analyzed a lot of the economics of the New York State Health Care Act, and we want to just get an idea of what are some of the strengths and the weaknesses of this plan. Do you want to use your slides again? Okay, great. Okay. Uh, yeah, I've been at this <laughs> for a long time. Uh, I first went to Washington with Michael Harrington in 1979. Some of you knew Michael. Um, and we were campaigning for lobbying for Ted Kennedy's uh, single payer bill um, up against Jimmy Carter, the renegade, whatever. But that's a long time. Um, and we still haven't done it. And the interesting thing isn't how long I've been at it but that I think if you get virtually any economist, not Avic Roy, but virtually any economist in a quiet room without a camera and it would tell, or you know, any recording device, and you ask, what should we do? They'd say, well, single payer, of course. You know, we all know that single payer is the best way to finance healthcare in terms of saving money and saving lives. So why haven't we done it? And you know, I, I've actually been spending a lot of time the last couple of years because one day I realized that every time I come up with something like $71 billion in savings, that's $71 billion of somebody's income. And that is problem number one. The costs of single payer are known and definite. Um, the costs to people who are worried about losing their jobs, yeah. The costs to CEOs who are worried about losing their inflated salaries. Um, the Wall Street Journal recently published a list of 2,500 um, uh, CEOs and others uh, at nonprofits who earn more than a million dollars. Almost all of them are involved in health care. Um, the list starts with the CEO of where I was born, Long Island Jewish Hospital, which is now part of a North Shore, you know, a big complex. Um, and that uh, gentleman is uh, paid almost uh, $11 million. What do you do with $11 million? Well, I'll tell you, one thing you do with it is you take a chunk of that. Oh, okay, he's a nice liberal. He donates to his Gillibrand and Clinton and all those things. But you take some of that money and you donate it to lobbying campaigns to kill single payer. Um, one of my brothers who lives kind of over there, um, uh, high up on Central Park West, so he knows a lot of these people, um, says, you know, all you're trying to do is to take on three of the biggest industries in the country in what is for them a life and death struggle, where they will commit all of their resources to save. The, the health insurance industry nationwide, the 10 largest health insurers are worth $500 billion. How much money would they spend to stop us? Well, okay, that's problem number one. 
Everybody knows how much it's going to cost them. Second part of problem number one is the taxes we talk about. I go out and say, okay, you'll be paying less in taxes than you're paying in premiums now. And the premiums, they're really a tax. It's just a private tax. You're paying a private tax to Aetna or Blue Cross or whoever. Well, that doesn't really cut it because people know that what, the, what we are asking for, a 10%, 8%, 12%, whatever it is, tax. The, third, the second problem, or the third, depending how you count these things, a separate category, is uh, the benefits of perspective. We're telling people, oh, it will be so wonderful, it will be great. Yeah, right. You know, who believes in, who believes in economists? I'll tell you, a fool. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know um, the benefits of perspective. Whereas people, when you talk about the health, they are very risk averse mm -hmm. because it's a big deal. We tell them how important your health is. Your health is your wealth, right? Well, I'm not going to risk my wealth on some newfangled idea that's coming out of Teddy Roosevelt or Europe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, or worse, an economist at UMass Amherst. So. Um, and finally, the third problem is, who are our allies? Our natural allies are the people who don't have health insurance. You know, 10% of New Yorkers, whatever. And these tend to be poor and disfranchised. And second, our allies are people who have bad health insurance. Maybe 30% of the country. 25% um, uh, of the country can't uh, report that they do not fill a prescription because of cost. Most of those people are insured. Okay, so they're also natural allies. But again, they are poor and they are disfranchised. And they're not as powerful as that guy who CEO of North Shore Hospitals. Thank you. So this next question is for uh, Kim or Marver. And as we uh, look at um, New York State and New York State legislature, legislature, what are the political strategies that we should be adopting now and in the future? And Mark, please feel free to add on to this question as well. Before I answer that question, I, I'd like to share with you the fact that um, when we talk about the safety net hospitals, which is now they're H&H, &H. they used to be HHC, they're now H&H. &H. All those nurses that work in those facilities are members of the New York State Nurses Association. So 11,000 of our members, we have to protect that work in the, in the Health and Hospitals Corporation. The thing that we all have to do, and being an organizer, is what you do. You repeat. So my repeat to you is educate, educate, educate. Not enough people know what single-payer health care is including my members. Not all of my members are on board. We negotiate contracts and the concept of negotiating, taking money from the member, which is what you do when you negotiate for health care, you take that money from the members and you give it to somebody else that's doing nothing for them. It, it's a, but whatever you have, it's really beyond difficult to give it up. I have health care and I don't want to give it up. So when I'm trying to convince my members that that may be the way to go because now we're going to have money that we can put into other things like differentials, like getting more nurses, like keeping the nurses that we have. The concept of giving up something as bad as it is, is something that most people cannot, they just don't want to do it. So what we do is to inform them that guaranteed health care means just that. It's guaranteed. You're not taking money off the negotiating table and giving it to somebody that does nothing for you. So you're left with the crumbs that you now have to divvy up. So education is the key to everything. That if you are a nurse or anybody in this country and you go out on and pay COBRA, anybody in there paid COBRA? I retired, I paid COBRA. I hated life. This was the most expensive. I could have bought a car for what I was paying in Cobra. So to know what's out there, education is the, is the thing every time. Any one of you is in a position to educate. That's, that's what we do. 
part of your conversation with the people that you know is, you know what we need in New York? We need single-payer health care. So let somebody ask you, what, it, what is that? Let somebody ask you. You be the advocate. So I'm entrusting all of the progress we're going to make, and it's going to be great to all of you in this room. So that's my, my thing to you is to educate. You know, talk about it. Make it known that it's something that we all need. It's not something, oh, pie in the sky. And as I said in the beginning, good morning, patients. It's real. It's really real. So one of the things that uh, nurses have been doing, as Martha men uh, Marva mentioned, sorry, M Marva mentioned was the advocacy that we do and actually the teaching that we do. Uh, another thing you can do is get really involved on a, um, in, in your neighborhood area. That's uh, one of the things that we do. But more specifically, I have actually approached where we had a, a HHC board of directors meeting at my hospital, which uh, in the membership was Dr. Mitchell Katz, who has taken on the helm of the HHC. And I actually explained to him what happens at a public hospital like where I work, where we literally get dumped. Patients without health insurance, patients with underinsurance that get picked up by EMS in purple uniforms uh, by a private hospital, it, it, it's better for them financially incentive for them to pick the patients which they don't want at the doorstep of their hospitals and dump, it, dump them at a public hospital. This happens every single day. And this is unjust, inhumane, and really against all human rights that I could you know, imagine. So what happens are these same patients, it's not like, oh, you know, they're just here to, because they're drunk and they're going to just sober up and leave. No, because these same patients come in in the middle of winter, they're hypothermic, their blood pressure is dangerously low, and they have other underlying infections. A, a private hospital just took their EMS guy to bring it to our hospital. They are getting critical care for the next five days. We cannot turn them out in the street and they're sober and they're okay. So the five days we're taking care of these people at a public hospital. And then when we, when we go to the public thing, oh, public hospitals, they're so poorly managed. You know, they waste so much money and that is absolutely false. The recent uh, study done by Barbara Caress and James Parrott, which demonstrates that public hospitals such as um, all the HHCs, where, uh, the Bellevue where I work, take disproportionate number of patients who are underinsured and have absolutely no insurance. Someone takes care of them and it's a public hospital. We do so much for so little. If you were to compare what we do in any other private hospital, we are much more efficient and we utilize a lot less dollars because we don't have a concierge service. We don't have a menu where you can order special diet and special meals. We don't get, you know, you come to Bellevue and you don't say, oh, how can I help you? Would you like some coffee where they do up the road three blocks? And this is absolute truth. Yesterday I worked in the ER. First seven patients, because of the weather, all underinsured uh, or no insurance at all all brought in by people with purple uniforms. And it doesn't matter who you are. Everyone deserves health care. And I believe that if you are not part of the solution, you are part of the problem. So this is for everyone. Everyone has a stake in this. And by not doing and by not participating, you're just telling insurance, take over my life. So, Mark, if you could please just um, talk about some of the political strategies that we should be adopting for single-payer health care. Sure. Um, yes, we have passed three times out of the Assembly. Mm -hmm. We have close to a majority of co-sponsors in the Senate. And Governor Cuomo, while not directly endorsing these bills, has at least said some positive things about single-payer. A little more on the federal level in the state, but it's, it's, uh, I think it's, it's moving in the positive direction with him as well. However, the culture in Albany is 
that in this period of divided government, which we've been in for most of the last couple of generations, um, bills which only pass out of one house or the other are largely disregarded. And the reason why the insurance industry has not mounted any sort of counterattack in New York State, not much of one that I'm aware of yet, is because they haven't yet taken this as a serious threat. Um, because they were confident that it would never move out of the Senate. We are on the brink of a te tectonic change in New York State politics that really cannot be overstated with the possible return to control of Democrats in the state Senate. We have to win a couple of special elections. We have to flip one more seat. Um, but we are really close to achieving that. And that is going to make what had been seen as an unrealistic possibility to one which is very, very, very realistic. And also will probably um, bring about a more forceful counterattack, uh, including uh, an aggressive attempt to peel off uh, our razor-thin margin in the state Senate, which on other contentious issues like tenants' rights, et cetera, um, hasn't been so hard to do, we have to admit. Um, so we're, we're in for a big fight. I think that anyone who cares about the politics of this should be watching the California governor's race very closely. Some of you probably are. But incredibly, uh, I think the most contentious issue in that race is um, single-payer health care, um, where the, the, the front runner, who's very, very, very far out ahead, Gavin Newsom, uh, has endorsed single-payer. And his most, um, the strongest challenger, Antonio Villarreal, also has dissented on that point. Um, and so it's something of a test case at how this issue plays out when the stakes are real, right? The guy who's the front runner to be governor has now endorsed it. So this is a lot more than uh, a one house bill in Albany, uh, which people mostly know is not going to be passed out of the other house. And, um, you know, it has been a little more challenging politically than some of us would have hoped. And the people who are against it have made a lot of hay out of the cost. Um, I have no idea whether the numbers that they're using are, are real. Uh, they, they probably aren't, but I think that they've entered the political dialogue in California, um, and the opponents have been able to say that this will add untold billions to the budget, which are going to have to be passed on um, as tax increases. And they've also been able to say that um, people who like their current health insurance are going to lose it. And... Uh, I, I think that we in New York need to look at how that's playing out and prepare um, for being hit with those arguments. Because when this becomes uh, a very real prospect in New York, we're going to be hit with it. And um, we have to have answers to people who say, I'm kind of happy with what I have now. Mm. And um, we have to have answers to people who say, this is going to double the New York State budget. And the uh, federal government's never going to let us use Medicaid money for this. So you can't take that money into your model. These are all the arguments, arguments which are playing out in California. So I, I, I know they're good answers to all of these, but let's get ready now for this fight going to a whole nother level the day after we take over the New York State Senate. Thank you. So Marissa, this next question is for you. Um, so in these past few months, we have seen like this unprecedented movement with young people around gun violence. And I'm wondering what lessons might we learn from that as far as mobilizing young people around um, health care, um, single parent health care? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think uh, everyone has been moved um, by the, the young people in the movement. I think something that we can learn and we can take away is just the first thing is that young, young people can advocate and young people care. Um, and I think that when it comes to healthcare and single payer, um, again, it's there. There are those young adults that really care about this issue, and so um, you know, really echoing what Marva was saying in terms of education is huge. I think for um, the way that we handled at Young Invincibles, the Affordable Care Act was really organizing young adults, really having authentic conversations with young adults around um, single payer. You know, educating them on what it is would be something we would do. Uh, we did that with the Affordable Care Act. And then find those young adult leaders, right, that are really passionate, they have great stories, they want to get involved, and really 
um, empower them to lead their peers in, in those conversations, right? And to enter into these spaces. I mean, I'm here representing Young, young Invincibles. I think having a young adult who has you know, had a huge issue with healthcare and really can speak passionately about why this issue would be important would probably be a lot more empowering than anything that I'm saying to you today um, and a lot more inspiring. Um, so organizing, advocating with young adults, and then, you know, sharing stories. I think that, um, you know, we, we heard what you face every day in the emergency room that's extremely moving. I think it's also um, bringing in the different stories about the experiences with healthcare and why this is needed. Having young adults who may have healthcare right now, um, but say this would this would be better because it's better for all New Yorkers, right? And it's better for all of us as a whole. Um, and really making sure that those stories are amplified and shared in person with those key decision makers that we would really need to to put the pressure on because very often. Um, we are talking a lot about the poorest, right? The, the poorest individuals, immigrant communities. And it is sad, but there are people in our state Senate and other places, or everywhere. <laughs> there are people everywhere that really don't care. Um, and so those stories, no matter how many you say, they don't really move anyone, right? And they're just sort of like, yeah, you know, there's poor people, there's immigrants, we don't care. So bringing in other people who really are privileged and do have good health insurance to say, this still matters, right? This is still something that I want as someone who votes, as someone who has, you know, whatever it is, um, whoever your, your target is, really making sure that all of these stories and conversations you're having are really framed very directly um, to those who you're trying to move. Um, and then, again, just constant um, for the Affordable Care Act, Young Invincibles really educated, um, continued to go out and educate. And then as um, it passed and as it was rolled out, um, continuing having those conversations with young adults. We continue to talk about health literacy, um, made sure that once, you know, once hopefully single payer passes that we're still, we're not just leaving everyone, right? Like, thanks for your help getting it passed. Now figure it out on your own. Um, having those conversations and especially, again, for immigrant communities, having those conversations in a language accessible, culturally competent manner so that they understand this is, this is how you keep the health, you know, the health uh, plan that you had before. Um, and so as we, you know, to, to uh, the council member's point, as we are figuring out and preparing how to answer those questions, um, thinking all the way through ex to execution and how we are continuing to engage individuals. Um, and so again, with young people, I think it is just um, taking away any sort of assumption that young adults don't care and that it doesn't impact them and that they, you know, I mean, we, we saw that. We saw young, young people just say they're, it's done. You know, why can't the adults figure it out? It's up to us. We're supposed to figure it out and we haven't. So I think that that is something that we can definitely learn when it comes to single payer. So this is an open question to anyone on the panel. So um, we realize, as I said previously, that single payer healthcare has been around for a really long time. So I really want to speak about what is the opposition? What is the biggest threats that we face? I know Marvis spoke briefly about, you know, education and making sure people are aware of it. And the council member also spoke about our political strategies. So can anyone just take that question as far as what is our greatest opposition? Is it, is it cultural? Is it political? Is it institutional? Is it a, a mixture of all those things? And, and how do we go about tackling that to move this forward? Uh, that, that is a, 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 a question as big as, as big. Mm -hmm. um, anything you can name is pretty much a reason for opposition. Mm. Fear is a reason for opposition. I work for a union. I'm, I'm in a union. So when you talk about guaranteed health care and that we have to have a system that guarantees health care, any one of us know of friends, family that are in horrible situations. They stay with people they can't stand. You know, they stay in jobs they hate and they stay there because of health care. So the fact that we don't have health care limits what we can do with our life. Every day, your everyday life. If other countries that are industrialized, that have strong labor union movements can do this, what is wrong with us? You have to ask yourself, we are the last great industrial country on earth that can't seem to do this. So something obviously is lacking 
in whatever it is we're needing. I say take, take, take it off the negotiating table. Don't even negotiate health care. Assume that you're going to have it. And once you start doing that, then you, that becomes your reality. It's like, I'm not negotiating health care. You know what? I better hurry up and make this so. So I, I think, too, it's not even taking a leap of faith. You take a leap of faith when you don't know the answer. Look north to Canada. You know, look anywhere else in the world, practically, in any industrialized country. It already exists. We are not inventing anything. We're just trying to catch up. So I, I really think that's part of the issue. You have your own mic. I knew you would have your own mic. There's an extra mic. Can you pass one down? Can you pass one well, down? to state the obvious, the insurance industry is going to fight uh, tooth and nail against this with its vast resources. Interestingly, I don't think we should assume that the broader uh, corporate sector has to be an enemy. Uh, you can argue that employers would love this. Um, and, and it's interesting how how um, corporate leaders in other countries have come to embrace similar programs. So let's not write that off. Um, you know, I do think that the challenges with labor are real and, and understandable that I think we as progressives should struggle with. And it's, it's partly because um, many uh, union members themselves have relatively generous health plans, um, uh, which they are wary of giving up, but um, there's another angle, which is that the unions themselves often, uh, a big part of their business model is, is tied to provision of health insurance. And, um, and I don't begrudge them that. Good for them for finding resources to, to invest in empowering working men and women. Um, and this is a time right now where uh, labor is under an incredible assault, uh, particularly with the Supreme Court case. Uh, Janus, which could strip uh, public sector unions of the right to collect dues from their members. Um, and that could mean the loss of, of hundreds of millions of dollars out of the coffers of labor unions. So um, in that context, they're even more uh, nervous about, uh, about the loss of, of some of the economic benefits that they're getting out of the, the status quo on health insurance. So. I think we really need to take that serious as progressives, not dismiss it and engage with them and, and understand them. Um, I'll just say on, on the broader political fight that if you want to know what you can do uh, in the next seven days, go up to Westchester County and campaign for Shelley Meyer to win that state Senate seat. And uh, because of how important it is taking back that chamber is for the reasons I mentioned. Um, and then um, send some very nice love letters uh, to Simka Felder, who is um, uh, potentially the swing vote, um, and tell him we, we, we love him and want him back caucusing with the Democrats. And, and then spend every day between now and November uh, picking, fi finding competitive state Senate seats to pick off um, around New York State, and there are many, uh, because we're going to need a margin or else we're going to be suffering from defections of one or two members for reasons I mentioned. Um, and, and also spend some time in the Hudson Valley and other places where we have swing congressional districts. Uh, an amazing number within a short drive of here, probably half a dozen that we could flip so that we win back a majority in Congress. There's an incredible amount we need to do in the political arena in the coming days and months to set the stage uh, for winning this fight uh, in the New York State Legislature and in Congress. Yeah, um, I've talked to a lot of legislators around the country over the, since 1979, um, and the number one concern that I hear from them, and we saw this in Vermont, when the governor suddenly switched from supporting single payer to dropping it. Um, we saw it in California. Um, is The number one concern is with the taxes needed to finance single payer. Um, and I can argue and we can all agree that these taxes, as I said, they're less than you're paying now and you'll be getting better benefits and everything. But um, to quote my state senator who at the time was pre uh, president of the Massachusetts State Senate, uh, and who nominally supported single payer. His name was on the bill. 
Jerry, all you're asking for is the largest tax increase in the history of the Commonwealth. Um, now, Avik Roy and some of the opponents who have been cropping up criticizing our work in New York State um, exaggerate, but still, the fact is, yeah, we'll be doubling the budget of New York State. You know, <laughs> I mean, yeah, okay, yeah. Um, it's still going to be saving people money on net, but legislators, politicians are very, very leery about voting tax increases. And, you know, I mean, my guy represents Amherst, which is like the most democratic place outside of, well, right here. But, <laughs> but um, still, he was worried about it because he represents some other places too. And um, other legislators are more worried about it. And then in Vermont, you know, a 10.5% payroll tax, um, it's exactly what people had been projecting for years, but then when it came forward, this is what you're going to be need. No, people panic, politicians panic. So what we need are, yeah, we need to make the case. We need to educate. We need to mobilize the disfranchised. We need to um, work with unions. But we also need to start thinking creatively about other ways that we can get to single payer in increments without requiring this sort of tax increase. Um, and I've got answers on that, but not enough time. <laughs> Thank you. So despite long and powerful opposition, um, there has been some progress, right? So we have seen some, some success, some strides with other states, such as uh, Massachusetts, Vermont, California. What sort of lessons can we learn from those states as far as adopting a single-payer health care for New York State? And this is a question for anyone on the panel. Uh, I just want to address that. I think we have to change the current narrative on what single-payer health care um, really means. I think, you know, we're only looking at actually the opposition, but we have to also look, look at really what it ultimately will do. So a lot of the argument, I lived in Canada, so I kind of understand, like, people say, well, you know, I had this woman, she's living somewhere up in Saskatchewan, and she had to wait six months for her hip replacement because of single pair. And that's absolutely not true. We had Dr. Ruben Strayer, who is a, a practicing physician both in Canada and the U.S., and he explained, you know, Canada is a really large landmass country with really not a lot of people. So there are a lot of areas where there's a sparse population. They don't have specialty providers in those areas. So in order to get that hip replacement, they have to schedule in to other areas where they can provide the care for you. But the thing is, they do get the care, six months waiting. But how many people do we know with good insurance, what we believe is good insurance, have to wait maybe a year, three years, or completely being denied the care? So that's the narrative that we have to present. There are plenty of people with health care, but actually don't get the care. So having insurance does not equate health care or getting care that you need. And I think that's a big, big narrative that we're not addressing, in my opinion, as an um, ER nurse, because so many people come to the ER who have insurance, but they can't seem to get what they need um, through the primary care provider, and the only way they can get it is through the ER, which is not an efficient way to provide health care. Um, this is another question that's open to anyone on the panel. Um, as we look towards the midterm elections in 2018, what can we do as voters, as citizens, as community leaders to bring the nation closer to a more universal health care for all? And I know we spoke already about education and we spoke about, you know, changing the narrative about what does it mean not to have health care. What other things might we, should, should we consider discussing? Well, health care is only one, uh, going to a doctor is only one way that people get healthy. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I mean, to tell you the truth, midterm elections scare the hell out of me because if we don't win, then we'll be totally screwed. And I think a lot of the establishment Democrats um, think that they can win by, we can win by just not being Trump and not, we don't have to present anything. We just, we're not him. Well, I think we tried that in November 2016. Right. It didn't work very well. Um, so that's my fear. As far as health, I think oh, 
we should be talking about single payer, but I think we should be talking about health in a broad sense. Health means housing. Health means um, access to a job. Health means access to, to decent food. It need, means nutrition. Um, and we could see this because the Trump administration is attacking health all across the board. You know, no food stamps, no this, you know, it's like, so, um, but I think we need to be talking about making a healthy country um, with clean air, clean water, decent infrastructure, jobs for all, and um, uh, in a way going back to what Franklin Roosevelt talked about in you know, his State of the Union address in 1944 with an economic bill of rights. And we need to really be presenting something like this as an alternative to what the Republicans and Trump are doing. Uh, certainly as a, uh, sorry. <laughs> certainly as a registered nurse, I mean, nurses always and have always looked at primary and preventative care. That's what one does. When you see a patient who is a diabetic, even a, a newly diagnosed diabetic, you know what the treatment for that patient is. But I also know, as an operating room nurse, what happens if they don't get it. You know, I get no joy out of doing amputations when all you needed to have was your insulin. There is no joy in any of the outcomes that we now are faced with when patients and people don't get preventative care. When you look at the person and you see the whole person, that wellness matters not waiting for you to get sick. I want you to stay well. Those are the things that nurses focus on every day in their practice and every day in their lives. I mean, I'm a nurse. I have to look out for myself as well. I think the other thing that we have to look at is how are we going to become change agents in the election? I'm a PAC chair. I look at that all the time. I want to know what candidate is going to embrace what it is I want, and I think that accounts for everybody. Everybody in this room, all politics are local. You don't want anybody that thinks that health care is not important to you and your family or that, you know, following the, the Trump model, that anything that's good for you can be. So I really think that to become active and to go to those politicians, they want you. One thing they want they want to win, and you can make that happen or not make that happen. So I invite all of you to become politically active and take that to the politicians. There are things that are happening across this country as far as getting politicians to be on camera selling that they support single-payer health care. It's called bird dogging. I follow you around. Everybody's got a camera. I have one in my pocketbook. Everybody's got one. It's simple. It's easy to do. You know, why aren't you for single-payer health care? You want my vote. Why should I? I mean, there are things that we must do to make it known how important this is for us. So I, I invite all of you to go to your politicians and those people that want offices and make your wishes known. Many of our, our politicians don't come to their own, you know, neighborhoods to talk to the people there because the people are upset. So they don't even want to do town halls. You know, you force them into these things because they want your vote and to recognize and realize that the power in this country is us. Mm -hmm. The people are the power and we can be anything, we can bring about any change that we're wanting. So I believe in that power. I'm, I'm the most powerful person on earth and people in this room, I just go for that. I would just say really quick to add on to that is also um, just engage, getting, getting everyone to be more civically engaged and vote. So I think getting a person who hasn't voted ever uh, to vote and then help move towards universal health care uh, takes, takes longer, <laughs> right? Uh, it's many, many steps, many conversations. Um, but as we approach these elections, it's just making sure that we are engaging all of these populations who live in our city and state that are not voting, 
right? And there's this feeling of disengagement. There's a feeling of hopelessness amongst many because of Trump, but there, there's also people who just haven't ever been engaged. There are people who are extremely politically engaged, and you're all here to talk about this issue. So, you know, I think it's safe to say this room is pretty engaged. Um, so you can take that extra step where you are bird dogging or you're, you know, planning a town hall. But I would say continue to engage those individuals that are marginalized and aren't contacted about this. I know for me, the Asian American community, I have been told Asians don't vote so that we don't even engage them. Like, what kind of message is that? And then, and then if you're going to approach those individuals because you want them to, you know, talk to their elected officials about their health issues and those sorts of things when you sort of, you know, didn't, didn't even <laughs> care what they were doing. Um, so really thinking about communities that are starting from scratch and are at zero and, and aren't voting, aren't leaving and voting and thinking about supporting those campaigns of just getting out the vote and getting people to register um, and be supported and not be discriminated against when they're going to the polls, um, then you can start to have those more meaningful conversations about issues like universal health care and other things. Does anyone else from the panelists want to address that question or should we turn it over for questions to the audience? Okay, so let's turn it over for questions to the audience. And we have a mic that's lots of hands going up. So Chris is going to uh, take questions, and we'll have the panelists address them one by one. And please introduce yourself. Oh, yes. even better. One thing that wasn't mentioned at all, despite all your excellent remarks, um, is the uh, population that already has universal health care, namely those of those folks, I'm not quite there yet, over 65 who have Medicare, who do vote. Uh, what about the AARP and all those other groups that seems to me that's vital to any coalition. That's number one. Number two, Cynthia Nixon. Is she for this? She should be. That's a way to get Cuomo on board. You know, that's like obvious to me, but nobody said anything about it. And then finally, in terms of changing the narrative, I spent three hours yesterday fighting with health insurance companies about my son's care. You know, I can't get them to reimburse stuff they're supposed to reimburse. And I do that all the time, like whenever I can find three hours. It's just unbelievably frustrating. I'm sure I'm not alone in this. It feels to me like that has to be lifted up as part of the campaign. Like, this is how we, you know, anyway, I could go on, but thank you. Thank you. So is there an, is, do you want to address her comments, Gerald? <laughs> as far as involving uh, the seniors, they're actually one of the hardest groups to involve um, because they already have it. And that's part of the general problem that we have in this country where so many people do have something, um, some form of health insurance, and are very, very nervous about losing it. You know, we live in a scarcity culture in what is one of the wealthiest places on the planet. You know, and people are very worried that, oh, my God, if you let other people have insurance, then it will cut into my Medicare. Um, yeah, that's why we need to add long-term care. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, the I don't know anything about Cynthia Nixon. I didn't even like Sex in the City. But, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. My wife and daughters did. Um, and your other question was the, the billing and insurance-related expenses within households. To my knowledge, I have not seen data. I know I've had the same experience as you. That's what all parents do, and my wife has medical expenses. So, you know, I've been dealing with this for 30 years, and it is horrific. In my numbers for New York State, a bit for what I estimate employers are paying for billing and insurance-related expenses for that for con negotiating uh, insurance, et cetera. Um, I am sure that if we put a dollar value on um, experiences like yours, I mean, you know, God, I'm not going to guess your hourly rate, but it's, you know, it will add up to a very, very large sum. Thank you. Let's take some more questions. Can I, can I answer that? Sure. Briefly, please. Briefly, I'm sorry. Um, I, I, I feel like you owns this mic, so I don't want to take it from him. Um, I think that 
those of us who are looking to see what is happening with uh, Medicare and Medicaid in this country are more than alarmed. AARP is in this up to their necks, you know, because that's one of the things that the people in Washington want to take away. They give their friends these massive tax breaks, a gift from us, and then they want to take from the rest of us. So I think we're already on it. I don't, I don't think that there are people that are not doing the work. I just think that it's not being broadcast enough. And as far as politics in the state of New York, who's going to be the governor? We have a pack. So part of becoming whatever you want to become in the state of New York is they have to come by us. And we have to make it difficult for them. So, I mean, it's pretty much, I'm back to full circle. It's up to us. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you. So we have another question. For uh, Councilman Levine, there's been a resolution in the city council for I don't know how long that hasn't come out yet in support of the New York Health Act. Maybe you can uh, comment as to why, given the, 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 the composition of the council, why it hasn't come out. And for Professor Friedman, there are a lot of friends of single payer who argue you can't do it in a state uh, because of ERISA, because of waivers, and so on and so forth. How have you been responding to them as you journey through these states that you've been uh, working with? Okay. Mine may be easier. Um, the, uh, the federal waiver thing, I think, is largely a red herring. First of all, ERISA doesn't matter. Um, you're not requiring employers uh, to send their employees to the New York Health Act, um, but it's perfectly within the state's right to levy a tax and then to provide the service. And if you want to go out and pay in addition for private health insurance, paying tens and tens of thousands of dollars for each worker, if you want to do that, and if your workers insist on using inferior coverage, then it's like, why on earth would anybody do it? So I think ERISA would just, dis would just not be an issue. Um, second, as far as Medicare waivers and Medicaid waivers, oh, people are always going around saying, oh, you have to get fed. Well, look, Medicare, you offer seniors a Medicare Advantage plan, um, which the tradition, the precedent in Washington with the Center for Medicare Statistics is totally clear. You offer a, re a financially responsible Medicare Advantage plan, they have to approve it. This plan would be better than anything any private insurance companies offer. Seniors would flock to it. You know, why wouldn't they? Just like with ERISA, private employers will just drop their own insurance because there's something free that's better. Um, and Medicaid, again, you offer the feds, you go to the feds, say we want to establish um, uh, an HMO, a Medicaid HMO, um, and we're going to offer these benefits. It's fiscally sustainable. It's financed through state taxes, so it's, there's no issue of bankruptcy or anything. Um, and this is okay. They have to approve it because it's what they've always done. To my knowledge, the CMS has never, and I could be wrong, somebody can correct me, I do not know of them ever turning down a legitimate state waiver request. And this isn't even a waiver. All, we're ask, all we'd be asking is that they add this to the list of, of Medicaid HMOs. All the other Medicaid HMOs would go away. Um, everything else would go away because nobody could compete with what the New York Health Act's offering. Um, so that, that's my, or, uh, politicians, especially Democratic politicians who want to find a way out of the bird dogging, uh, they bring these up because it sounds like a problem, um, but uh, it really is, these really aren't. Councilmember, do you want to address the gentleman's sure. question? Um, look, you, you've heard from me. I strongly support single payer, and so do most of my colleagues, the great majority, I believe. Um, I think there was a resolution that started to move towards the end of the last session, and uh, things just got crazy in the last few months, and it didn't. Uh, there, there wasn't time for a hearing. Um, the previous health chair, by the way, uh, who was an amazing health chair, was Corey Johnson, was also a strong supporter. A single parent, of course, now the speaker, and I know he remains committed. Um, I, I presume that there will be uh, a resolution moving uh, in the near future. I, I but uh, 
I, I, I'm not the lead sponsor, so uh, I don't have control there. But um, again, you know, where, where I stand is very, is very clear, and, and I think almost all of my colleagues agree. Okay, let's take a few more questions. Is it working? Yes. Okay, and then we'll do one on his side. Thank you very much. I was fascinated by the various response. Uh, to Jer uh, Professor Friedman, uh, one opposition factor that I haven't heard mention is money. And uh, when we had a recent uh, coordinating committee, we were talking about the press because uh, I vote now in the Hudson Valley and we meet people all over the place, businesses and individuals, and they have no idea that the bill is in uh, Albany. Mm -hmm. So when you talk to them about it, they say, yes, of course. So one of the things that we found out is that the press, depending on the board composition, if a lot of them are representative of the pharmaceutical, the press will not publish anything about the Albany. And I wanted to know, uh, you know what you think. And also, sorry, the other factor is as long as uh, people can accept money, uh, the ele elected officials can accept money uh, for, uh, from insurance and pharmaceutical, it, it's going to uh, take a lot of work to uh, change that narrative and have candidates who will refuse money from uh, the company. Thank you. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, the, the financial factor is huge. Richard Master, who did um, a businessman from Pennsylvania who did the Fix It movie on healthcare. Um, he's now, and then he did a movie on Big Pharma. Um, and now he is just released. Actually, I think it's yesterday. They just released a new movie on money and politics. Um, so, uh, I mean, Councilman Mark can probably talk more about money and politics than me. Um, but I can say money in academe. I can talk about money in academe and in the media. Um, and if you look on, I, I had a grad student research assistant do this, uh, you'd be nasty enough to look on the boards of the major uh, um, research places, uh, major think tanks involved in healthcare, and they're filled with representatives of big pharma. I mean, you know, you know Robert, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation is, of course, an extreme one, um, but it is a wholly owned subsidiary of the R.J. Johnson Pharmaceutical Company. Um, but others, like the Commonwealth Fund, they do great work. Um, but yeah, they've got, you know, Bill Frist's brother, the uh, former CEO of Health of Humana Hospitals or whatever, on the board. Um, and you go down, they all have representatives of Big Pharma and the hospitals and the insurance companies. Um, but we have people. And we're right. And that's really got to count for something, especially if, as was said, we educate, educate, educate. But it's our task is going to be more one on one rather than the mass media, I think. Okay, thank you. Isaac, let's take a question on this side. Good morning. This question is from Martha. Uh, you mentioned educate, educate, educate. And I was wondering if there are a component of this. Um, movement that deals with educating people in terms of staying healthy, eating healthy, healthy nutrition that would help them from being your future patients or being in the hospital period? Uh, certainly. If you, when you're in a union, I mean, your mantra in internal organizing is just that. Educate, educate, educate. Me talking to you is going to make the difference. I think that every nurse is concerned with primary care. I mean, that's what we do when living in New York City, but having facilities that are way up in Western New York, out there in the hinterlands where they have more cows than people, which is not my world. Those nurses practice really a different, obviously, kind of nursing than I do. A lot of it is in the home. So you don't only get to educate the patient, you have to educate the family because they are co-chairing with you on providing the care that that person is needing. So I think nurses have always been focused on primary care. It is more efficient, and it's certainly more heartwarming to see a well person than a sick one when you could have prevented that. So we spend a lot of time on prevention. That's, that's what we do as nurses. 
So the whole issue of talking to people and one-on-one out in New York, I mean, Kim works at uh, H&H, and I worked at Mount Sinai, the monster right uptown there. Um, so I, I really think that to focus on what it is that's important, and for nurses, number one is always the patient. So it's really easy for me and for nurses to say, I want you to know this, as opposed to what happened to you. So I, I really think that all of us have the same mantra. All of us. Anybody that's armed with knowledge has a role to play, and that is educate, educate, educate. So we are focused on preventive medicine and preventative care. That's what one does, you know, as a registered nurse. He still has his mic. Let's take another question. On this side, another yes. Okay. I have uh, one question for Dr. Friedman and then more of a comment, which I think you can answer my concerns and then we can educate more people with this. One has to do with um, if you can comment about how malpractice, uh, the industry of malpractice affects all the costs in this. And the other has to do with, um, I'm on Medicare. Medicare is great for me. Um, there are fewer and fewer doctors uh, providing Medicare, being covered by Medicare insurance. So when you say Medicare for all, I'm all for it. When you say Medicare Advantage plans in HMOs, a lot of people are not in favor of that. Mm -hmm. And I think what, what I'm concerned about is the haves and have-nots and the greater disparity in New York State city and New York State. So I don't know how to put that into a question, um, but that that disparity there, I'm not, I, I will be against it if you're going to try to put me into an advantage plan because my insurance currently now, Medicare is excellent. So I don't know how you square that. Yeah, well, we would be calling it a Medicare advantage plan, but it would be fee for service. It would be what you have now. Um, but in terms of the law, we'd have to be calling it that. Um, the, uh, the malpractice issue, yes, yes, uh, uh, as far as malpractice, this issue comes up a lot, um, and on the right especially, they like to say, oh, well, you know, high medical costs in the United States because of the malpractice system, um, and that leads to, and then you point out, well, oh, you know, malpractice is a tiny, tiny part of the cost of health care in the United States. And they say, but it leads to over, um, over treatment. It's hard to find over treatment in the United States. We generally treat less than in every other country. We go to the doctor less. Um, you know, we do do more MRIs, but it's, it's, you know, I'm sure that there's some. Now, the real issue with medic with uh, malpractice is that this is the only way that hurt people can get some protection, some coverage for them their loved ones. Um, you know, something bad happens. You may, it may just be one of those things that happens. Nobody's perfect. Whatever, there may be no ill will or incompetence. Um, but how do you get something for your hurt loved one? You have to sue. You know, um, so this is partly a consequence, the ma ma malpractice business is partly a consequence of our lack of health insurance. And um, the other piece here is most real malpractice um, is committed by a very, very few physicians. Um, and they sometimes even go from state to state. Part of the problem is we do not have a national database of doctors and, treat and treatment. Uh, this is a problem for epidemiologists. If you want to do epidemiological research on what works in the United States, you've got to go to the Medicare population who are elderly and, and disabled and therefore, you know, those two groups and therefore different than the whole population, or you use the VA. So all the really good research is done by those, for those two populations who are unusual populations. Um, uh, but it also means we can't track doctors. You could commit lots of malpractice in one place and then pop up in another place. and. The different insurance companies, nobody knows. 
Okay, we have, uh, we're running out of time. A burning and a, one on this end, so maybe. We, ha we have a lot of questions, so let's keep your question to Brief. 10 seconds or less, and let's keep the answers to 20 seconds or less. One over there, and then one over here, or are we ready over here we right can now? can take one over here. That's you, Jim. All right. Okay. Um, so my mate, oh, sorry. Go ahead, please. Yeah. I have a comment, which is that if you do this, New York State's plan has to do cost containment. Every healthcare system, every universal one, the British national healthcare system and so on, have to do cost containment. It's a hard thing to do. It's a hard thing to do well. And public insurers have largely the same toolkit that private insurers do. I'm not disputing the savings in having one uniform system, but that has to be admitted becomes a target and the things that people don't like in HMOs and so on now become what the state is doing. Okay. Isaac, is there a question over there? Yeah, so to follow up on what she was saying, I know that um, in hospitals they always gun for maximum retail price. Like something, like I get MRIs for instance that cost 3300 In Japan, probably be $200. So we pay tenfold just costs on everything from blood work to scans to hospital stays to, to obviously drugs. What can we do to implement standard prices just across the board so we're not paying maximum retail price for all these healthcare services? One would think that if one has uh, universal healthcare, that those things would evolve naturally. That if you are getting the insurance companies out as the middle, I have to keep your voice. So I hear you. If you, if you, then I have to lower my voice. If you are taking insurance companies out of the equation, then things are going to change just because they're going to change. One of the concerns, and I think I talked about it previously, is the fear of giving up something that I don't know what's going to happen. Those of us in collective bargaining, you know, are very used to negotiations. And if I want this whole table, you know, as part of what I want in negotiations, and I'm only going to negotiate for these glasses, I'm going to take the glasses because the next contract, I can probably get the whole table. So at some point in time, you're going to have to be able to say, I want, you know, for 100 years this hasn't happened. It's not going to happen overnight. And when it does, it's not going to be perfect. So we have to accept that it's not going to happen overnight and it's not going to be perfect. But like everything else, it's something that we get to work on and that will evolve. If we get over, I got this and I'm not giving it up as opposed to, I don't want to say take the leap of faith, but I like the term. So, thank you for that short response. Do we have another? Question? We have time for one more question, right. uh, and then we'll, the, pan the panelists will hang around at the end. Um, we're gonna after this question, we'll bring up Dr. Freudenberg, who will give us some thoughts for mm -hmm. continuing. And all the panelists can stay a little bit longer, right? And yes. so uh, we'll have an open kind of networking conversation after. So please keep. Uh, Hold your questions till after the event and we'll move forward. One last question here. Yeah, this is a question about internal organizing. Uh, I believe let a thousand flowers bloom, but that's also a problem. Um, School of Public Health has this wonderful forum this morning. Uh, the CUNY School of Social Work has, a, has another forum. The Professional Staff Congress, which represents faculty and staff, holds an intergenerational forum with young invincibles on economic insecurity across generations, but we're operating in silos and we're not, as organizations that want to address the single payer issue, we have failed so far to pull this thing together. Uh, and I'm wondering what the panelists have to say about that. I think, well, <laughs> God. Uh, on my, in my form here, I have a list of for organizations that is incomplete. So what one does is try to break down the silos by doing coalition work, by meeting with other groups. In, in just in the state of New York, there is a 
you know, list of people that New York State nurses and others are working with to get rid of the silos and to recognize the commonalities that we all have rather than the fact that we're all different. So I think we are working on that, but the work is slow. That, that this room should be packed to the rafters, and it's not. So how does one fix that except to offer yourself and your information to whoever comes? So I, I think we are working on it. It's just slow. One more question. Well, what I, I wanted to address that specific question. It may seem like there are a lot of silos. Uh, Katie Robbins here with the side table is with the New York uh, uh, Health, I'm, I'm sorry, I always forget the actual, what we, it's NewYorkHealthCampaign.org. That itself is working with all of these other local and uh, state coalitions. Um, it may seem like this is one forum, but we have had hearings Okay, Godfrey had hearings all over New York State on people coming to talk about their personal experience, their healthcare experience. We had live testimonies, and that's all available on the New York campaign. And this is an opportunity not to be a silo. This is a great opportunity to get involved. We're working on a national front, too. Marva and I just came back with a huge labor notes organization where we had all of these other unions unions throughout the U.S. where we work together and strategize. We have another campaign coming up in June in Minneapolis, Minnesota with Healthcare Now, which is a national front for the single payer movement. And within those, we also have people that have had, you know, mobility uh, strong campaigns in California, in New York, and uh, Vermont. So it, it, it may seem like a silo, and I'm so glad that you are here. And it's a great opportunity not to be a silo by just getting involved. We have the New York, uh, New York State Health Campaign, which is for the overall state. Um, perfect segue. Thank you. Um, I'm Katie, the director of the Campaign for New York Health, which is a statewide coalition advocating for single-payer universal health care in New York State. We work with representatives from hundreds of organizations. We're constantly growing. We work closely with the lead legislators on the Bill, Dick Gottfried, and Gustavo Rivera. And there's a few very simple asks that I have for you all today. Everyone should have received one of these postcards. Uh, the, this is our petition to the New York State Senate, which was mentioned that's where the fight is right now. If you could fill out this postcard and turn it into us before you leave today, these are being gathered all over the state to deliver at our annual lobby day in Albany on June 5th. Uh, the annual Advocacy Day in Albany is an opportunity to see all of the amazing people who represent the organizations and individuals who support this from all over the state. I'm really happy to say we have actually 12 local organizing committees made up of volunteers who are pushing tactics of the campaign, the postcard drive, the survey to ask people about their healthcare experiences, um, canvassing businesses, doing public forums. It's really an incredible network. Um, of people who are really trying to change what is politically possible in New York State. So I hope you will sign up and join us. There will be buses leaving from New York City, probably one from uptown. Um, but we really need you to, to sign the petition and join us on June 5th. Uh, this is just part of the process of changing uh, what is politically possible to win real health care for all in New York State. So thank you very much for the opportunity to say that. Thank you. So we would like to now welcome Professor Nick Fordenberg for a few closing remarks. And again, the panelists will be here, so you can come up later and ask questions. Thank you. Good morning. So on behalf of the CUNY School of Public Health and the Scholars Strategy Network, and I too am an active member and encourage those of you who are academics to check it out. You can. Uh, Google and look and see how to join. Uh, it's an organization that helps scholars to bring our voices into public policy. And I want to thank the panel and all of you for this uh, lively discussion. In our roles as advocates, scholars, policymakers, health professionals, and the other roles we play, a key part of what we do is to bring questions into the public discussion. That's what we can do. And I wanted to try and summarize some of the things I heard about the kinds of questions as we go forward this afternoon, next week, next month, that we can bring forward to keep people talking about 
single payer in New York State. So first, I think there are questions of evidence. And we need public health and epidemiological evidence, we need medical evidence, and we need economic evidence to bring into these discussions uh, to make sure that policymakers and decision makers are informed. Uh, I believe within the next few weeks or months, there'll be another study on the economics of New York single payer, uh, this one put out by RAND, and probably more pessimistic than some of the, uh, the facts we heard today uh, from Jerry. We need to be ready when that study comes out to uh, help people understand those numbers and to understand what the source of the difference is from some other reports that have been out. The second kind of questions that we need to be able to bring to the constituencies that we serve are policy questions. What's the best strategy for moving single payer forward? Uh, what are the governance mechanisms that will help us to achieve our goal? And as someone on the panel said, we also need to be thinking about implementation. When this passes, what role are we going to be able to play, are our institutions going to be able to play to make sure it happens well? We saw some of the implementation missteps in the early implementation of the Affordable Care Act really hurt a lot. And, and let's be smart, and let's make sure we do it right. Third, and we heard a lot about this from you all and from the panel, there are questions of politics. How can we use the 2018 election? How can we make sure that at the state level and the national level, single payer is an issue in the 2018 and 2020 elections? How do we build alliances? How do we make sure that the emerging social movements, uh, the uh, movement to end gun violence, the immigrants' rights movement, the LGBT movement, are part of this single-payer discussion? What can you, I, each of us do to connect the movements that we're part of, the community organizations, the professional organizations, to this issue? And what can you do tomorrow, next week, and next month to move that forward? We also need to be asking on the political front, what can each of our institutions do to move this forward? And I'd like to take just a few seconds to talk about in my role as a faculty member and researcher at CUNY. So as a result of the Affordable Care Act, we were able to cut the number, the proportion of students at CUNY who lack health insurance from 20% to 10%, a huge step forward. But there's still 27,000 CUNY undergraduate students who lack health insurance. Single payer could fix that. Single payer could fix that, and it could also help the many more students than the 10% who lack <laughs> adequate health insurance. And that will help CUNY to achieve its goal, because an insured student is better able to focus on school, is less likely to drop out because of a health emergency. So it's in the interest of CUNY, this institution, educating 278,000 New Yorkers to have single payer so that our, we can better achieve our mission of educating young people. What are the questions in each of your organizations that relate to single payer? And how can you study those, bring those forward, and mobilize people? And the fourth and maybe the most important uh, type of question that we need to bring forward are moral questions. What kind of a nation do we want to be? What kind of a state do we want to be? What kind of a city do we want to be? And how does the single payer issue relate to that? And not only how can we bring in the, our own organizations and the social movements and the community organizations and the labor organizations, but how can we bring in organizations that have morality at their heart? How can we bring in faith-based organizations? Some are involved, but many more could be brought in. And what are our connections, each one of us, to those organizations that we can mobilize them so we're not in silos, but we're speaking out loud and together? Some of us, myself included, sometimes get discouraged that we don't succeed in what seems to many of us such an obvious issue, why single payer is a, a better idea than what we have now, that we don't succeed on the first try or the second try or the third try. But as you get to be my age, you know, and you take a look back, it took decades for child labor to become illegal in this country. It took decades to end legal segregation. Uh, 
it took uh, many years to put policing practices on the policy agenda of this city. And it took many years for gay marriage to be legalized. And on each of those questions, when those questions first came up, people said, that'll never happen. Couldn't be, you know, not in this society, you know, not in a capitalist society. But I think what we want to do is to bring this moral, political, rational, economic question to the forefront. And it will become the notion that everybody has a right to health care will be inevitable. And that we will then be able to ensure that single payer gets implemented here in New York State and everywhere else. Thank you. Thank you for those very inspiring remarks, Professor Freudenberg. So with that, we're going to close out the event. Thank you all for coming. Again, our panelists are here, so ask your questions. We have lots of food, so please eat the food as well. And there's also literature on the table. Um, this event has been live streamed on CUNY SPH's uh, Facebook page. So please um, you know, tweet about us, Facebook it, and we will have the video available also on the YouTube channel for the CUNY School of Public Health. Thank you all for coming out. <laughs>